personally, I don't think that producing facts and statistics is going to make a huge difference swaying the mind of hardcore Republicans or hardcore transphobes who don't believe in trans rights or who scaremonger about detransition. But it's nice to look at sometimes, just see like, okay, here's what the statistics actually show. And there are reasonable people out there who are receptive to statistics and peer-reviewed information, and they respect the scientific process. And to them, we can appeal. We can say, look, there is a groundbreaking study out of Australia, out of Perth Children's Hospital, showing that only 1% of patients receiving care detransitioned or desisted with virtually no loss to follow up. So looking at this, okay, Perth, Australia, uh, this was published in JAMA Pedi Pediatrics. Uh, they found that 1% of trans youth who were receiving gender affirming care at a clinic, uh, went to, they went ahead and re-identified with their sex assigned at birth. Only 1% of all of them. That was in addition to the 4% who re-identified during the mental health assessment period or earlier and did not proceed with receiving gender affirming care. So there were 4% of people in this study, 4% of trans identifying children who stopped identifying as trans during the mental health assessment process. So the screening process that's supposed to keep people out who shouldn't have done it, it's 95% effective in this instance because 4% were correctly screened out in the initial process of screening. And then only 1% got through, received medical care, and then decided to desist from receiving, from, from like identifying as trans. So that's, that's pretty solid. The study was based on 552 young patients from a time period of 2014 to 2020. They measured re-identification rates in 2022. This one is going to significantly influence the debate on gender affirming care from, according to Aaron, uh, due to the unique methodology, which resulted in virtually no loss to follow up. The detransition of status of 548 patients was successfully determined. So in previous in previous instances where studies have been done on whether people are detransitioning after they start transition, the one study, the 80% study that everybody points to had a lot of people just drop out of the study halfway through, but the people who were conducting the study just counted those as desisters, which is like a deeply flawed methodology. And in this instance, there were very few people who dropped out of the study, basically 552 patients were studied and 548 of them had their status confirmed in the study. It's not like, oh, a bunch of people dropped out and we're going to just conflate that as part of our data. Like, no. If you're enjoying this video, hit the like button, maybe subscribe, hit all notifications if you want. Feel free to check out the links in the description. You might find some merch you like, or you can hit up the Patreon to support the content and find free stuff. So yeah, this study is going to be the one that we go back to and keep citing over and over again. Uh, it's most compelling study right now on the low detransition de rates. The study examined every patient who attended the clinic from 2014 to 2020. Out of 995 referred patients, 552 had their records closed by 2022. For these closed records, researchers determined the reasons by examining medical databases to ascertain if patients continued to adult care. Okay, so yeah. So it's like you're getting trans-related care at the child place, the Perth Gender Diversity Service for the Youth Gender Clinic uh, in Perth. So if you stop going, if your records are closed, then that's either because you aged out and you are now in the adult system, or because you desisted, or in the case of there were four cases where they were unable to find a reason why the account was closed. So that's a very low loss to follow up which refers to the portion of the data set that could not actually be collected when following up with patients who did not respond when contacted. The vast majority of the records were closed because they were transferring to adult services. Only 29 patients re-identified with their sex at birth, and of those, only two did so after the mental health assessment and commencement of gender-affirming medical care. So of more than 500 patients, two of them started medical care and then decided to stop taking it. 27 of them found out during the screening process that they did not want medical care and they closed their, their account there. But like the remaining 500 plus people seemed to just go on to continue medical care into their adulthood. 
this study does not look at regret. Like they did not look at the reasons for detransition or desistance. They, you know, could not ascertain whether any of those who returned to unidentification with their sex at birth later pursued adult gender affirming care. It would be unclear. Also, the extent to which family pressure influenced the decision to re-identify with sex assigned at birth is uncertain because they were just looking at the accounts closing. Like they, they basically just looked at, okay, all the patients at this one gender clinic, okay, those who closed their records, let's look at the reasons why they were closed. That's what the study is. Like, the, you know, they don't have a lot of extra detail. It's just like, why was this, why did this person stop seeking care at this clinic? Overwhelming majority just aged out and started getting healthcare at the adult clinic. Anyway, it's good to have such compelling evidence, like really well done research showing that in, you know, a, co a country around the world is doing the same thing. Look, an English speaking country with ostensibly a lot of Christian people who live there, like that's kind of a feature of a lot of people like places with a lot of white people in them. And look, like they don't, I don't know. Are you going to try to claim that this is a global like contagion that, that transgenderism is a global cultural thing? I don't know, but these kids are getting the medical care and they're doing well. And then they're staying on the medical care. They're persistent. They stick with it. So whether you believe oh, people can't actually change their sex. Like, I don't think that any of us really care at the end of the day. Our experience of our sex and our bodies is dramatically different. So if you want to keep asserting something that you have never personally experienced, that's fine. But like, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you want to objectively call us male or female or whatever. You know, I mean, it matters in the sense that you're trying to restrict our rights based on that definition. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, we're just going to do our thing. And the medication helps. Like going on hormones helps. It just makes our brains feel better. Lots of people start hormones and they're just like, wow, I suddenly don't feel like kind of dissociated all the time. I had this vague feeling of crappiness and now I don't have it. And then as the changes start to happen, the physical changes, like growing a beard or growing boobs or whatever, that is like an extra bonus benefit that we get to celebrate but mostly it's just that feeling of oneness in your body. The medication works by and large, overwhelmingly, the medication works. We've tried to do psychotherapy. That was the first thing that modern medicine tried to do was to analyze this as a psychological phenomenon. And you can give people tools to deal with distress, but why would you do that if you can just give them something that resolves the distress? You know what I mean? And then trans people start going to therapy instead of dealing with our dysphoria, we go to deal with all of the crappy ways that people treat us because of our trans status. They literally claim that there's a global conspiracy among every major medical organization and research journal to push, to push transgenderism. Yes, well, you see, they have, a, I don't know, whatever. I'm not even gonna pretend to say something right wing right now. I don't have the energy to be funny. I think one of those strongest things about this particular study is that they got to look at this, all this follow-up, that there were very few cases where they didn't know the reason. Because another thing that these gender criticals and TERFs will claim, they'll claim that the very high success rate of transition is a false number because the people who regret it are too ashamed and too upset to actually go in and report their regret. Like, so there's this idea that the information is skewed. But look at this, you know, we only have four cases out of almost 550 that were, we could not confirm why they closed the account. Most of them went on to go to the adult health care. At least in the time that they were at that clinic, they were consistent and persistent with their genders, which is true for most people who have gender dysphoria. So yeah, here we go. Just proof that, you know, overwhelmingly, it's, it's not because people are dropping out of the studies. It's not because people are too ashamed to say that they regret. People just don't have that much regret with these medical procedures. They just don't. Oh yeah, yeah, this is just more proof on a massive pile of existing proof. But I'm just saying, with other studies that don't necessarily have the definitive follow-up, you know, other studies, people will drop out 
because of health reasons, because they had to move, because they started school, because they started a new job and they can't get time off to come back to the study. Like people die, you know, there's lots of reasons. And so I think other studies in the past have perhaps not had that component of knowing for sure the reason why the person desisted or like having access to and like knowing for sure at the end of the whole thing because they're not relying on contacting the patients since they're just looking at the existing medical records of closed accounts. So yeah, we'll see if this makes any difference that this study happens to be so much more ironclad than other ones in the past. You can't claim that people are just too embarrassed to say that they regretted it. Much love to my patrons, especially Tiago Nascimento, Mersh Rolvog, Michelle Frateroli, Amanda B, Wellington Marcus, Michelle Winter, Danielle McDonald, DZXN, Suzanne Maynard, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Jamie Jam, Pastnell Infinity, Nova, Sojo, Elizabeth Bartell, Ella V. Nobody, Kevin Young, Sarah A., Athiet, Celeste, Desi Quiche, Liam Hodgson, and Mr. Atheist.